five months ago, I made a video about the most forgotten champions in League of Legends, and I've decided to make a part two. So what does it mean for a champion to be forgotten by the player base? Well, it means no one plays them. This can be for a multitude of reasons that I'll go over in the video. Starting off with Zoe, this champion is very unique in the sense that she falls under the category of a burst mage with zone control. So her job, as you'd expect, is simply to one-shot people. While I'm sure all of you have experienced getting imploded by a Zoe Q, she's actually not very reliable in terms of her zoning capabilities. Let's say you're playing Zoe and your team is trying to take Dragon. Your typical play pattern would be to shoot your E towards an enemy champion and the punishment of getting hit by it would be to get hard chunked or one shot. However, in modern League of Legends, mobility and tenacity are very strong. With all the mobility that exists in League, it's really hard to land your bubble directly on another player. However, even if you do land it, modern tenacity makes it so they're not asleep for long. In laning phase, this doesn't really matter, but in a high pressure mid to late game situation where you have to position properly, comboing your E and Q is much harder nowadays. With her most consistent setup tool being weaker overall, it's more impactful to just toss your sleep in the general direction of the enemy as a pure zoning tool, rather than trying to hit an enemy champion with it. Which isn't very skill expressive and doesn't feel cool to do since that playstyle is not what Zoe players prefer. All of these things combined with the fact that she's really difficult to pick up and has a high skill floor while also having an insanely high skill ceiling makes her very hard to master. This means that she's just not in a state where people enjoy playing her enough that she doesn't have a low play rate. At the highest level of play, Zoe can be extremely oppressive to play against, however because that's only the case for the highest levels of play, her risk to reward ratio is too skewed for people to want to put in the work to get there. Why try to master Zoe when you can play champions like Syndra and Orianna? Both of these champions still have high skill ceilings but their skill floor is lower and they have more consistent tools, being good wave clear and scaling. Zoe also doesn't scale great, so with low elo matches often going to late game, she's a lot weaker to play overall where most of the player base is because she requires high skill and isn't great late game. With everything considered, Zoe is forgotten. But champions aren't only unpopular when they're extremely difficult to play. Taric is a champion that unfortunately suffers from the way his kit works. Taric is a frontline enchanter, however his kit consists of healing and shielding his teammates. He has a stun which you think could be used proactively, however because of his lack of mobility he doesn't have any tools to engage with in his kit. This leads to a playstyle that feels lackluster considering he's supposed to be frontline but has no engage. One of the most stimulating parts of his kit is his passive, which gives you high attack speed after using an ability. However, for the most part, you aren't able to flesh out this mechanic because he's a support champion. So you'll be playing against ranged champions, meaning you won't be able to force an engage and auto attack them since you have no mobility. Also, spamming abilities to min-max Tarek's passive is punished by the fact that he has mana issues. So even if you happen to be blessed with a melee matchup in the bot lane, it's still hard to use his passive in a way that's satisfying. Circling back to his lack of engage tools, Tarek's most successful playstyle is being reactive, meaning you only start fighting once the enemy engages onto you. So Tarek as a champion excels at counter engaging, but this aspect of League requires a lot of game knowledge to do properly, so he's also gatekept by most of the player base at its core. The reason that's the case is because counter engaging successfully goes hand in hand with knowing the enemy champion's limits, your team's champion's limits, and your own limits. This is a especially apparent with his ultimate. There are scenarios where you can use Taric ult aggressively, like during a tower dive, however hyper aggressive plays like that are only performed by players in high elo since they also require a lot of game knowledge. So for the most part, Taric ult is used defensively, especially in low elo. The best way to use Taric ult is to wait until you see that the enemy team has committed and engaged onto your team. However, knowing whether a commitment is actually happening, especially in a high pressure situation like a team fight for an objective, takes a lot of game knowledge. For example, a great terror player would have thought to themselves what abilities in the enemy champion's kits do they need to use to reliably engage. Then they look out for those abilities. However, in low elo, they obviously don't do that. He also is essentially completely dependent on other players since all of his abilities are buffs or work in tandem with other players. He shields people, he heals people, and his stuns use can only be perfected by working with your teammates. So not only do terror players need to have insane game knowledge to play him properly, his team 
teammates also have to have great game knowledge to play with him properly. However, since Tarek isn't played often, players don't have many opportunities to have experience with his champion, and therefore rarely know his limits enough to min-max their gameplay with him. Zillion's another champion that suffers similar issues to Tarek. Zillion's a mage, but also in some ways he is an enchanter, with move speed buffs and his ult being able to revive teammates. However, while he does have access to stuns, he also does not have any engage tools within his kit, besides a move speed buff, but that doesn't really matter considering he's not a frontline champion like Tarek. The optimal playstyle is to play reactively, which like I said earlier requires a lot of game knowledge to do properly. Zillion excels at punishing poor positioning with his stun and slow, but to wait for the right moment takes patience. You would think, oh well in low elo where most of the player base is, I bet they miss position all the time. Well that's right, but capitalizing on mistakes is way easier said than done. To be able to do that, you have to actually know that a mistake is being made and why. If you were to play a champion like Pyke, you're able to create the opportunity to shine. However, with Zillion, that opportunity isn't artificial. You can only optimally play him reactively, which is a playstyle gay kept by knowledge. Overall, this playstyle doesn't really feel rewarding to play, especially with the skill of an average player. Along with the objective fact that probably not many people care to play as a champion that's just an old man with outdated VFX. Another mage that was forgotten is Cassiopeia. Currently, she's actually not bad against tanks. However, in mid lane, meta picks are very strong against her, and she gets beat by long range champions like Syndra and Victor. She gets outranged, so she can't trade well with them. In terms of her overall champion design, she's just inferior. The former champions mentioned have much more utility than Cass, being poke and wave clear. On top of the fact that she's just not as good, she's also insanely hard to master. Usually with a skill ceiling that high, you're rewarded for playing well, however with Cass, it's not very satisfying regardless. She feels very weak to play. She has no mobility to combat mobility creep and her W is too short range for it to be as useful as one would think against mobile champions. She can be strong and competitive in pro play, however, that's only in niche scenarios like being against a team of melee champions. With that, she's also hard to buff in casual league because it risks her becoming too strong in pro play. At a little over a 2% play rate, Cass is forgotten. Sitting at a lower 1.9% pick rate, Elise is really hard for an average player to want to pick up. Her entire kit is centered around aspects of the game that aren't aren't usually fleshed out by players who are low elo. Examples of this is tower diving, flanking, and setting up picks. Like I briefly mentioned earlier, tower diving is a very aggressive thing to attempt. The reason low elo players don't really do it is because it takes confidence in your skill as a player to shot call it, having so much at stake. You risk your teammates entire lane phase based on a play that doesn't necessarily need to happen. Not only does your skill matter, you have to trust that your teammate plays it well too. However, in low elo or casual play, you and your teammate are most likely not on the same wavelength. In terms of setting up picks and flanks, you have to really be paying attention to the match and have to preemptively craft a plan. So not only do you have to be constantly thinking about your decisions while playing, which is already a high skill thing to do, you also need to predict where the enemy will be and how long it'll take them to be there, all based off educated guesses from your game knowledge. All of this to say, players are gay kept from playing Elise properly because of the game knowledge it takes to use her. She's bad at team fighting, and since spamming 5v5s are usually the way low elo games go, the players who try playing her definitely feel underwhelmed. Another undead champion that was left in the dust is Yorick. One of the biggest issues that contributes to his pick rate is the fact that there's no community attention towards him. Occasionally there will be a funny clip of a Yorick split push backdoor, but that's it. There are no very large content creators that play him, and because the only media attention towards him is split pushing clips, people often chalk him up as a boring split push champion that spams his Q. However, while his playstyle does revolve a lot around pressuring the side lane, his kit is still very unique. Unfortunately, it's hard to appreciate Yorick's unique kit specifically as an average player because his power is not front-loaded into his base kit. A lot of his strength is shared between his maiden and his ghouls. To use his ghouls, you need to land a skill shot and his cage is a really hard ability to land on a target, especially with all of the mobility that exists in modern League of Legends. This means that his power as a champion is locked behind skill expression which never helps a champion's popularity especially when his undead aesthetic is shared with several other champions that are more forgiving
getting to play. Aside from having to play a good amount of games to understand Yorick and get better at him, his playstyle as a split pusher is a gift and a curse in low elo. On one hand, low elo players don't understand how to deal with pressure on the map, but on the other hand, low elo players don't understand how and when to split push in a way where they create as much pressure as they can while not risking too much. For example, if a player split pushes late game and they draw a lot of pressure and die, but Elder Dragon is spawning in 30 seconds, that means that player's team is now at a huge disadvantage in terms of fighting for Elder in a 4v5. On top of all of this, even if you play the macro well, the average player as a teammate doesn't understand how to make use of the pressure being given by their laners. Uniquely, Yorick's play rate in lower elos is actually pretty high. However, because he's a champion that's not consistently strong, he's ignored in high skill levels of play. Overall, Yorick's lack of media attention, his unique but seemingly weak kit, and his inconsistently resulting playstyle causes him to be forgotten. Another champion that lacks media attention is Nidalee. I mean, the most known content creator who played her was Tarzan, but now he barely touches her. A couple years ago, I actually met Tarzan in real life at TwitchCon 2022 in San Diego. We had mutual friends, so I got to meet him. Very chill guy, by the way. And since we live in the same city, we took the same flight home. We talked about League for a bit, and he ended up telling me that Nidalee is his favorite champion, but she's too weak to consider playing seriously anymore. This was at the time when Aatrox was by far the most broken champion in the game, and the example he used was, how am I supposed to play a champion like Nidalee around champions like Aatrox? Basically, that's Nidalee in a nutshell. But let me explain. Nidalee is a very difficult character. She's easily one of the highest skill ceiling champions in the entire game, while also being extremely hard to pick up and learn. Both of these stem from the same reason. She has seven different abilities. As a shapeshifter, she constantly has many varying options to choose from, all while under the pressure of an actual match. You can separate both forms into ranged and melee, however her ranged form can set up her passive which then buffs the leap of her melee form. Also, once you turn melee, you can no longer heal yourself, and since the cooldown to switch is a couple seconds, you're committing to each form during fights so you have to pick between them properly with no hesitation. Since you're typically squishy, messing up your combo flow during a battle is very punishing. Another reason why she's so difficult to play is that she's a jungler, which is the highest skill ceiling role in the game since it isn't a lane. Every other role has a skill floor since they're all based in a lane, so if you try to learn them you at least have some grasp on how they work. However, in the jungle you're playing a whole different type of game. The easiest example of this to give is how in a lane your opponent is right in front of you, while in the jungle you don't necessarily know where your opponent is. Sure, high elo players would have developed jungle tracking techniques at that point which gives them a solid educated guess on where the enemy jungler could be, however in the average player base that's not the case. And since that's not the case, the average player can't utilize Nidalee to her full potential. This is because she's great at invading enemy junglers. Nidalee is a very aggressive champion. She's an assassin with no CC. Invading in general is a high risk, high reward tactic since you risk wasting time you could have spent clearing your own jungle by invading and hoping you kill the enemy jungler and take their camps instead. If you fail the invade, whether you die or end up not being able to kill the enemy or take any of their camps, that means you wasted precious time and fall extremely behind which a lot of the time can mean it's GG, especially in high elo. And you can't just perma farm on her and not invade in general because she's not great at doing that. The point of her champion is to invade, so in low elo, people don't really use her properly anyways. Well, since she's so difficult to pull off, she's surely good in high elo at least, right? No. She's still underwhelming even when she's played to her highest skill level. Because of her unforgiving playstyle, being an invading assassin with skill shots and mobility that she can only access in one of her two forms, she's so volatile that unless you're a high challenger player, playing her against other amazing players feels too hard anyways. Speaking of female champion, did you know that 97% of the female league players exclusively play female champions? I go over that and a lot more in my video where I tackle the social argument that women are worse at League of Legends than men. Go watch that after this video if you're interested in the answer. Mwah. Kog'Maw is the most reliant ADC in the entire game. Being a hyperscaling and mobile artillery ADC means that he's basically useless on his own. He literally needs a support to reliably deal damage, stay alive, and scale to the late game where he can actually unleash his power. But not only does he need a support, he needs an enchanter. Kog'Maw is strongest when it's enchanter meta because those are the supports best suited to keep a champion alive. The only reason a 
champion like Jinx is more popular than Kog'Maw while being in a similar boat is because one, her passive grants her mobility, and two, she's one of the most famous champions because of her presence in Arcane and multiple cinematics along with Fortnite. But while Jinx can be relevant while still having the exact same kit she came out with, a champion that's the opposite is Shivana. Shivana has a very cool concept, being able to transform into a dragon. However, she's just incredibly outdated. In her base form, she's essentially an auto attack bot, and when she ults, she becomes a huge dragon and is still an auto attack bot. Along with her outdated kick comes with the fact that she has an identity issue. Her jungle clear is really good, and she solos dragons the fastest out of any other champion, but she has no CC or relevant mobility to pull off valuable ganks. Her wave clear is solid, but she's underwhelming compared to meta top laners. Most people end up playing her as a full AP burst mage, but her damage is only relevant and satisfying when she transforms into a dragon and uses her E. Anybody who still plays Shivana is just waiting for a rework and praying to the Riot God that they make her cool and fun. Unlike Shivana, who's a really old champion, Nefiri is one of the newest champions added to League of Legends. Unfortunately though, she sits at under a 3% pick rate which is really low especially for a new champion. While she has an interesting design being one of the first true monster champions in a long time and being a Darken, that didn't save her from the forgotten allegations. Nefiri isn't terribly hard to learn or use, she has a cool approachable design and she's a new champion. So why does no one play her? Well to put it simply, she sucks. She's an assassin so her strength is one shotting squishies, however in Nefiri's case that's literally all she's capable of doing. One shotting a single target. Combine that with the fact that her early game is extremely weak, getting set behind is an automatic loss. Assassins like Katarina are notoriously able to come back from doing poorly early since she can dish out a lot of damage to multiple targets especially on her item power spikes. With Nefiri's single target ultimate she doesn't have that same capability, so when she's set back it's almost impossible to be useful afterwards. Since all her kit allows her to do is damage, if she's not even able to one shot a single person then she's useless and is essentially dead weight to any team when behind. Now a champion that has multiple options is Ivern. However, people think all this kid allows him to do is shield people. In the jungle role, there are two main uses for a champion, doing damage or being super tanky with CC. Ivern at first glance doesn't identify with either category, since he's mainly seen as an enchanter. Unfortunately, that playstyle isn't really sought after from players who want a jungle. Even though people think all Ivern does is play supportively, he can actually deal a lot of damage. Ivern's ult Daisy does an insane amount of DPS and disrupts players with her knockup. If you learn to micro her properly, she becomes extremely annoying and dangerous. However, an aspect of Ivern's kit that no one pays attention to is his W's passive. When he's in a bush, his auto attacks deal extra magic damage. So even if you don't have Daisy available, you can just spawn bushes wherever you want and auto the enemies for a deceivable amount of damage. So a lot of people don't think about playing Ivern because they assume he needs to be built with support items, even though he can do a lot of damage. But on top of this, Ivern's passive is part of the problem too. It's very unique, being that he can't damage jungle camps, but he harvests them after a timer. Getting used to this mechanic is one thing, but because his jungle clear is dependent on specific timing, you have to learn his exact clear properly or else you fall behind. Overall, Ivern as a champion is gatekept by the player base's assumption that he can't do any damage and the high skill floor required to play with his unique passive. All of these champions are forgotten by the player base. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and hit the like button. And I'll catch you all next time. See ya!